listen to Dr. Scott French um, talk about a trust betrayed, Eatonville's Hungerford School in historical, cultural, legal context. And this lecture is a part of our last Wednesday speaker series. And this one is a conjunction with our Maitland History Museum. And the reason why we're talking about the Hungerford School, which was located in Eatonville, as part of our Maitland History Museum is because Eatonville and Maitland share the same origins. They were founded in the same places, they were founded by the same people, and they share many, many of the same stories. <clears throat> and so tonight, um, I do want to introduce Dr. Scott French, who is an Associate Professor of History and Director of Public History at the University of Central Florida. His research on the intertwined histories of Maitland and Eatonville has been featured in curated exhibits at the Art and History Museums of Maitland here, and in Eatonville, Zora Neale Hurston Museum of Fine Arts, as well as Winter Park Magazine, WUCF Central Florida Road Trip, and CBS Sunday Morning. His peer-reviewed essay, Social Preservation and Moral Capitalism in the Historic Black Township of Eatonville, Florida, a case study in reverse gentrification, has appeared in Change Over Time, a journal of conservation and the built environment. So please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Scott Frank. Thank you, Danielle. Um, thank you all for coming out. Um, it's really always a pleasure to be here at Maitland Art and History. I've had a long relationship with this site going back to when I first arrived in uh, Central Florida in 2011. I worked on what was then the permanent exhibit, no longer the permanent new exhibit now, um, but uh, have always had a very special place in my heart for art and history and I really appreciate their work to bring the stories of Maitland and Eatonville together. Um, I have a lot to cover tonight because I've uh, I'm going to be reporting out on a lot of research that um, I and some of my students have been doing um, over the past year. Uh, we've been really devoting ourselves to the study of the Hungerford School, uh, even as events have been unfolding. It's almost impossible to keep up. Things are unfolding. The story of, of what is happening around the Hungerford School property is happening so fast that um, I just, I almost have to throw my hands up at times and just say my timeline is incomplete. Um, but I want to really kind of reach back in time and look at the origins of the Hungerford School and some of the really complex but really important legal history that uh, I think will add context. Even if you've been following the story, um, I'm hoping that what I share with you tonight will maybe deepen your understanding and raise some new issues uh, for exploration. So I'm going to get right to it because I have a lot to cover. But I just want to start with uh, uh, N.Y. Nathiri's uh, uh, sort of tribute to Hungerford uh, in 1991 as part of a, a book on Zora Neale Hurston, a woman in her community. And she's talking about Hungerford from a very personal experience. Uh, Hungerford was a way of life. The school was a shared community experience and its society helped to bind even closer an already tight-knit community. Hungerford School was more, however, than a training ground for life. The school represented Eatonville's collective priorities and how to provide for future generations. The people of Eatonville knew that the Hungerford School was very important and many of the town's adults had not formal training, but as a community, it was their intention that the town's children always get a good education. Now, this was written in 1991, and today, uh, Dr. Nathiri and the Association to Preserve the Eatonville Community are leading the fight to save the Hungerford School property and uh, make sure that Eatonville and its citizens have control over what happens there. So. Um, I like to start all lectures sort of with Juneteenth because uh, really this is a story that begins with emancipation and mobility, the story of being able to move uh, in search of a better life, better opportunity. Um, that really is in many ways the definition of freedom. Um, as we all know, the dream of 40 acres and a mule uh, was really dashed by uh, politics. Uh, President Andrew Johnson reversed efforts to redistribute the uh, abandoned lands uh, among the freed people. Um, and uh, in many cases, the people had to set out in search of, of a homestead, a new homestead somewhere. And uh, that's a story that we, we may know from uh, the West, right? The exodusters of the 1870s uh, went out to Kansas and started uh, community settlements like Nicodemus, Kansas. If you've been to the Smithsonian, you've seen the exhibit uh, on the historic black settlements. These were settlements, not towns. We're going to talk about Eatonville as a very unique uh, form of this settlement because it, it did become an incorporated township. But the, the same impulse is, is, is present. Uh, I, I think what's interesting about Eatonville and Central Florida is it represents a movement south. People don't think about the frontier being to the south or freedom being farther south, but 
this was a very much a, a land of opportunity in the 1870s. It had not been settled uh, for very long. Uh, pioneer settlers, both black and white, were moving into this area, uh, looking for opportunity, uh, homesteads. Uh, there was employment with the railroads coming in. Uh, citrus was coming in here. And so uh, really, if you want to hear about that moment in, in the, this area's history, read Zora Neale Hurston's uh, Dust Tracks on a Road, and she gives a really compelling sort of early history of African-American settlement in this area. And she really places it right here in Maitland at Lake Lily. Um, she's basically talking about how the white people settled around Lake Maitland and uh, African-Americans settled uh, around Lake Lily, which was at that time uh, known as St. John's Hole. A lake as round as a dollar and less than half a mile lot wide. And, and even when she's writing this, uh, it's, it has, its name has been changed to US 17. Uh, but it's really fascinating, exciting to sort of know that Lake Lily is really a, a historic site. And really, this is where many African Americans were forced to settle because they weren't really settled. In fact, they were denied the opportunity to buy homesteads. Uh, we know from Joe Clark, uh, who was one of the founders of Eatonville, that when African Americans first came to this area, um, they made an effort to buy land. Um, but that they were denied. Um, they tried. They were, they came here to create what was what we now know today as freedom call a freedom colony. Sometimes they're called race colonies. Um, but they came here with a very clear idea uh, to make a, a kind of community settlement. And but as he points out, so great was the prejudice then existing against the Negro that no one would sell them land for such a purpose. And so this is why when Zora describes the shanties around Lake Lily. That's why people were living there. They, were, they could not buy land uh, because no one would sell it to them. The land was also very valuable for citrus, and so there was some, some uh, other reasons for denying them access, but they certainly wanted a part of that. And um, what, what Joe Clark tells us is that uh, one particular um, ally in the effort to create a settlement, a permanent settlement for African Americans, was a man named Lewis Lawrence who came down from Utica, New York, um, and uh, he uh, he had a citrus grove on what is now Lake Avenue, and he employed African Americans on in that citrus grove, and it bothered him to see uh, to see them without churches or homes. He said, uh, the people here seem to expect the labor, to, the, the workers to sort of rise up out of the mist in the morning and disappear back into the mist at night. They really didn't care where they lived, they just didn't want them living there. And so he reached out to Josiah Eaton, who was a year-round resident, a white Navy captain, ex-Navy captain from Maine, and arranged to uh, purchase land from Eaton. Um, Eaton and Clark had a relationship Clark worked for Eaton. So the three of them uh, really worked together to create uh, an opportunity for African Americans to buy land, um, to, uh, to, to buy land on terms that would be affordable. So uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This is a whole other lecture. But I just wanted you to understand that um, Eatonville gets its start as a settlement within Maitland. It's a subdivision within Maitland. Uh, Lawrence platted a village for the colored people near his grove. He made 48 small lots and home sites available for purchase on, quote, easy terms. He erected a framed church for the village residents, the first in the area. And if you go to Eatonville and you see the historic Thomas House, that is believed to be that church. It was moved across the street, so it's the oldest building uh, still standing. Um, St. Lawrence is named for Lewis Lawrence, by the way. Um, so Eatonville starts as a subdivision within Maitland, and in fact, in 1886, before it even became a town, this is a description by Josiah Eaton of Eatonville, circa 1886, one year before it became an independent black township. At present, the village has two churches, a Masonic hall, a store, and a school of some 30 bright children whose willingness and eagerness to learn cannot be excelled. So already, there's a school, there's a, a, an established community. Um, and it's, it's really described as a model um, for what can happen when African Americans are uh, afforded the opportunity to buy land and, and live under their own vine and fig tree. You know, the, the idea of this was the goal, have your own land. Um, and so uh, they see it, Lawrence and Eaton see this as a wonderful success and a model solution to the race problem. Um, they, uh, 
and, and they protect this settlement by including uh, codicils. Uh, they're worried that, uh, at least Lawrence is worried, that uh, without some protection on the deeds that uh, predators will come in and snatch up these lots. And so there are deed restrictions. These may only be sold to colored people. That was to ensure that the community does not get broken up. Um, and so Eatonville exists from 1881 to 1887 as a subdivision within Maitland. In fact, some of those residents helped to found the city, the town of Maitland. They are incorporators. About one third of Maitland's incorporators were residents of the subdivision. But in 1887, they decide they're going to strike out and on their own and create their own independent township. And they do. 27 African-American men on August 18, 1887, 27 African-American men sign the town charter and uh, create uh, one of the earliest incorporated black townships in America. It, it had for a long time believed to be the first, but there's a claim, I think Princeville, North Carolina claims it's a little bit earlier, slightly earlier, so we now say one of the earliest, but it's still clearly uh, at, the, at the forefront here. Uh, and the story of Eatonville goes viral. It's well known. Uh, you saw the newspaper, which, by the way, that newspaper I should have mentioned is part of Maitland Art and History's collection, the Eatonville Speaker, the only surviving issue here in Maitland Art and History's collection, which is where I first encountered it. Um, but the story goes out all over the United States. And um, Eatonville's black founders are recruiting people to come settle. Come here. Come settle. And no speculators. You have to live here. This is a community. It's an intentional community. So that's the start. That's the back story. Um, now, into this new community come two very important figures, Russell and Mary Calhoun. Both had attended the Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute. Um, they, they didn't attend quite at the same time, but they, they were there for nine years together at, at total. Um, Russell Calhoun graduated. Mary had to drop out because she got sick, but they both have been schooled in the vision of um, sort of moral training and uh, the belief in self-help and community development. And they are going to become teachers. They come to Florida get, to get to get jobs. Actually, they, they came, um, I think they ended up going to, they were planning to go to South Carolina and that fell through. They come to Florida instead. They take their teaching exams and they're assigned to the public school in Eatonville. Eatonville has a public school. Um, and they, they just said, this is the place to be. Uh, and this is Calhoun's recollections. We were here but a few days when we decided this was the place for us to begin putting into practice the lessons taught to us at Tuskegee. We felt that we wanted to do something toward helping our people. We decided to cast our lot permanently in Eatonville. And Calhoun writes elsewhere about the importance of this being a historically black town. That was important to him. That's why he really understood that the school that they wanted to create would make so much sense being built here. Now, Calhoun was hired as the principal of the public school, but he had a kind of a larger vision in mind. He wanted to create a private boarding school based on the Tuskegee Institute model. And he wrote, there are more than 4,000 Negroes in the county and over 40,000 south of us to Key West, and not another school of its kind for colored boys and girls. We must face these facts and ask the good friends, both north and south, to change the condition of things. And so um, they wanted to win over the townspeople, and they began to sort of model Tuskegee's principles. Um, uh, they, would, they were, um, and he goes into some detail about how they did this, but uh, really showing uh, lessons in economy and um, you know, cleaning up the streets and things. I don't think that was, you know, I think they just wanted to sort of begin to uh, demonstrate uh, what it meant to sort of uh, you know, emb embody the lessons of Tuskegee. Um, and so they have this vision of a private boarding school. Where are they going to get the land for it? Well, a couple of years before that, uh, and this is known to Calhoun, Edward Waters College, which was a, uh, I believe it was an AME affiliated uh, normal and industrial school for African Americans in Jacksonville, announced plans to relocate its campus to Eatonville if sufficient land could be provided for an agricultural education. Now, whether they would fully relocate or create a satellite facility, their idea was that Eatonville could be part of their, uh, their footprint. And uh, Ed Edward C. Hungerford of Chester, Connecticut, who was a winter resident of this area, I believe he owned land, from what I can tell from his deeds, he owned land around Lake Lily, may well have owned the land that the shanties were on. Um, he offered to donate 20 
acres adjacent to town here in Maitland. Um, and the townspeople of Eatonville pledged to raise another funds for another 20 acres, but the deal never went through. The conditions were not met. And so Edward Waters College didn't come here. We all know that it's not here now. Something uh, prevented it from coming through. But Calhoun said, ah, I think this would be a great opportunity. And he reached out, he wrote a letter to Hungerford asking if he would donate the 20 acres of land that had been offered to Edward Waters uh, to the, for the creation of an industrial school. Hungerford agreed to donate 40 acres and, and more uh, with the provision that it could be, would be used for school purposes. And that's important because that gets written into the initial uh, deeds for the Hungerford School. It will be used for the education of black people. That, that, that's, that's written in. And Hungerford, that was part of Hungerford's, Hungerford's vision and Calhoun certainly wanted that as well. Um, and so the school uh, is launched. There's a board of trustees is selected and with the aid of nine men, they cleared a, an acre and a half of land while their wives finished dinner, we started what is now the Robert C. Hungerford Industrial School. This is all from Calhoun's memoir. Um, okay, so why was it named Robert for Robert Hungerford and not Edward C. Hungerford? Um, the name was apparently a, a memorial tribute to Hungerford's son, his deceased son, uh, who was well known to Eatonville residents. There are a lot of different stories about Robert Hungerford and how, why, how and why he got sick uh, he was a doctor. Some accounts say that he was he came down with yellow fever uh, while treating African Americans, uh, but none of that is really documented. I think basically what we do know is that he had died of an incurable disease, typhoid typhoid fever. But what was interesting to me was, according to at least one report. He took a great interest in the successful development of Eatonville as a purely Negro city, and the colored people became much attached to him. For me, that just means there was a relationship there with Robert Hungerford, even though he had died by then. Um, the, there was some, it wasn't simply a name that meant nothing. Um, and certainly the Hungerford family had been attached to Eatonville. There are reports that the Hungerfords donated books uh, to the people of Eatonville before it was a town, and that a library was created by the young men of the village. Um, so, who served on the original Hungerford Board of Trustees? And here I'm gonna to point to some research done by one of my fantastic students, Sarah Boy. Um, she took on the task of uh, trying to identify um, all of the trustees who are mentioned in various, from various sources and found some very interesting things. So, here's the 1899 Board of Trustees, and I'm gonna break this down for you um, in terms of who they are. Um, one, the president, of Hungerford Board was actually the superintendent of public instruction for Orange County, which is interesting, right? It's, a, so it's supposed to be a private school, but what you find out is from the very beginning, Hungerford and the public school system are intertwined. The public school system um, made no formal provision for the education of African Americans before beyond the grade school level. And so they looked to Hungerford to fill that, that niche. They really, in a sense, were um, you know, taking advantage of the presence of Hungerford to do what they should have been doing, what they were supposed to be providing to all of their citizens. Uh, they, they basically looked to Hungerford to fill that gap. And um, they, they, they basically treated it as an adjunct to their public school system, which, which primarily served the white population. Um, and so the Orange County School Board quote, consented to make the Eatonville Public School a nucleus for the proposed industrial school, thus giving a full supply of pupils and a couple of teachers paid out of the regular school funds for, of the state to start with. And you see this merging of public and private. In fact, my belief is that when Zora Neale Hurston attended, and she writes about this in Dust Tracks on the Road, she's there in, uh, until about 1905, I mean, she writes about, a really, if you want to read what it was like to be in the Hunger Art School, read her account of it. But I believe she was a public school student. And so you had public and you had boarding school students attending alongside local black students who would have been in the public schools, and teachers from both the public and the private school working together. Um, other representatives on the board of trustees, members of the local, prominent members of the local white community, 
Um, and so you see Lauren Chase, who was a founder of, the, of Winter Park, a co-founder of Winter Park, proprietor of the Winter Park Company. Sidney Ives, an Orlando merchant, and I believe he was also on the school board. Uh, Reverend Charles Redfield, pastor of Winter Park Congregational Church. And Mary Thurston, who lived in the home that is now the Thurston House uh, in Maitland on the border of Eatonville. You all know, and maybe some of you are familiar with it. Um, but Mary Thurston was also there. And, um, and this was important, right, to have local white citizens who could be uh, vouch for the school, right? Um, and Calhoun notes in his fourth annual report, I've not said much regarding the difficulties and struggles to plant this work, but I'm glad to say that from the beginning we have had the friendliest support and advice from all the white people of this section, officials and citizens alike. Getting them on the board was important. There were also, very importantly, representatives of the Eatonville community. And um, here you'll find the mayors, two, two of the mayors of the town, actually three mayors, uh, Mayor Samuel Mosley uh, and, and former mayor and town founder Joe Clark were both founding board members. Uh, Reverend John Hurston, Zora Neale Hurston's father, was a member. He joined briefly the board of trustees and served in in 19, between 1901 and 1904. And the postmaster, Matthew Brazell, uh, was one of the, who was one of Eatonville's original incorporators, also appears regularly on the trustee list between 1903 and 1934. And I'm telling you all this to say, at the very beginning, Eatonville had a real presence in the governance of the school. And that's going to change. That's why I'm emphasizing who's on the board. I want you to understand the racial makeup, and I want you to understand sort of who is being, rep which groups are being represented. Another important group are representatives of the Tuskegee Institute. Um, there were two officers of Tuskegee. Treasurer Warren Logan was the treasurer of, 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 of Tuskegee. He was a graduate of Hampton. Uh, he often served as the acting principal at Tuskegee in Washington, Booker T. Washington's absence. And Robert C. Bedford, who was a white pastor of, of, of a colored congregational church in Montgomery, Alabama. That's Booker T. Washington's words. Uh, he was secretary of the Tuskegee Institute. So two officers of Tuskegee serve as board members in, of Hungerford. Washington himself was not on the board of the Hungerford School, but he, he vouched for it, spoke openly, endorsed it. He wrote a letter of recommendation for Calhoun, and he actually featured Calhoun and his work at Hungerford in uh, a book, 1907 book, The Negro in Business. So he devoted a lot of attention, and he said that um, he really said, Calhoun, uh, the coming of this man was the most fortunate event which has happened in Eatonville. So uh, eat, really, Calhoun should be up there with Joe Clark and the other founders as a really important figure in the history of Eatonville's development. Now, why is Washington important to this? Remember, the, the founders are coming from the Tuskegee Institute, Russell and Mary Calhoun. Um, and the Tuskegee Institute was, was known far and wide uh, for specializing in the training of African Americans for employment in the industrializing New South. Um, now, this kind of education was, was deemed acceptable by conservative, leading conservative white Southerners because in their eyes, it trained blacks for second-class citizenship and didn't threaten the existing social order. And so uh, Tuskegee was, was always seen as, and Booker T. Washington very strategically um, you know, understood how to present uh, education in a light that would not be viewed as threatening to the powers that be. Um, but, as you'll see, I'm going to bring him back in and say he was quite critical of the structure that denied funding to black schools. He was not oblivious. He was, he was absolutely uh, outraged by that. But I wanted to say that the Hungerford School was seen as a mini Tuskegee. The newspapers, uh, one newspaper article identified it as one of 23 industrial schools founded by graduates and former graduates of the Tuskegee Institute. And, um, and in fact, uh, you can really try to map. A lot of them are not even discoverable today uh, if you try to find them on a map. But um, that's important. There's a network of graduates going out and creating many Tuskegee's. And one of them is here. Um, that, that relationship to the Tuskegee continues. Mrs. Booker T. Washington. Margaret Murray Washington, they call her Mrs. Booker T. You can see that on the poster here. She visited Hungerford School in 1902. She spoke at the dedication of a new dorm, dormitory named for Booker T. Washington. And um, so 
there's in, in, you can see that the school rests on a very solid foundation of, of support from these various groups. Now, how do they fund themselves? They have to raise the money. They're getting very little from the county, very, very little, and you'll see in a minute just how little. Um, and in fact, when Russell Calhoun puts uh, appeals out for, for, for money, um, he says, our school is not supported by any society or state. We live by who will listen to our story. And he travels through no the Northeast and gives that story, shares that story, even goes to Los Angeles at one point. And we've been able to sort of map him around the country uh, trying to raise funds. Um, and so who donates the funds? Um, Northern white philanth philanthropists, uh, patrons are the primary source of funding. They, they're really critical to the financial stability of the school. Um, and you can really map this geographically they come from nine northern states, uh, from Pennsylvania, really Pennsylvania North, and you can see them listed here. But um, really, it's also important to note that African Americans, while they were uh, not able to fund, provide as much cash toward the school, that they were seen as vital to the support of the school as well. Um, and in, um, so they're getting labor and they're getting cash. Uh, when they can. Among the donors listed by name in the annual report were Eatonville residents Joe Clark and Samuel Mosley, the AME Church of Daytona, and the Colored Baptist Church of Daytona. And in fact, um, Calhoun writes in his autobiographical sketch, the colored people have had little to give in cash but have been most liberal in their contributions of labor. They have been willing to help themselves. And it's really important to, to make that clear. They gave what they could. So what, what was the curriculum? Uh, head, heart, and hand. Basically, uh, you know, it is an industrial school, so there's an emphasis on uh, training in uh, uh, skills that would be uh, fit you for employment, right? This is going to give you a place in the economy, and you can see how it's gendered, girls and boys, the different uh, areas in which they are being trained. But importantly, Calhoun in the annual report notes, we give no industry at the expense of literary work. The academic department covers a useful course of the English branches. We don't have a real breakdown of exactly what that means, but if you read Zora's uh, Dust Tracks on a Road, she's doing readings uh, in class, and you sort of get a feel for the, the literary education that the students are getting. Um, and and I, I'll just leave it there. I don't, I, I don't have time to share her words. Sometimes I've just read from her account. In fact, I think I included here. But I wanted to give you a picture of sort of the the campus itself. This is Booker T. Washington Hall. Um, this is Principal Calhoun in the first quartet. And I believe that's um, Mary Calhoun on the left next to him. She's not identified, but I'm fairly certain that's her. The sewing room, blacksmith and wagon shop. This is, these are the captions on the photo. It's teaching farming at Eatonville. Um, and the school got a lot of coverage. Alexander's Magazine uh, did a full feature on it in 1905 and, and noted that the campus had grown to 280 acres, which was larger than the town of Eatonville itself. And um, that's important to know, too. There's a, this is a lot of land. Today, there's about 100 acres left, but originally it was close to 300 acres when, at its peak. More pictures. Eight buildings, including two dormitory shops, a barn, and a dining room. Uh, and interestingly, the students ranged in age from 8 to 37 years old. I think that when we hear students, we have this kind of picture that they're all of a certain high school, elementary to high school age. But there are adult learners, people who are, are uh, attending perhaps as, and paying their way by working on, at, you know, uh, that's, that's part of the model, the Tuskegee model, is you, you uh, pay your tuition through the work that you're doing um, and producing uh, goods for sale. Or, or food, and feeding, and growing food to, to be used by the, the students, right? They, it's a self-sustaining community. This is the Zora Neale Hurston, um, uh, her account. There's so much more to be, to, for you to read there. I, I'll just encourage you to read that on your own. OK, an important milestone. In 1910, Russell Calhoun dies. and. His wife, Mary, succeeds him. But that's really seen as a turning point in the history of the school. They really begin to sort of struggle financially after he dies. Um, he Remember, he was traveling the country raising funds. And so he, he had established a lot of good relations, strong relationships. 
and uh, you sort of see that as a, a, a turning point. Um, but the school continues on, and in fact, Booker T. Washington, in, I'm sure, in, 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 in an effort to also help the school, during one of his famous Southern tours, he stopped in Eatonville, and several thousand colored people, according to the newspaper, and a number of white people who make their winter homes in the community attended the ceremonies. Um, and um, they, they, there's, there's a fair amount of coverage of this, uh, e this event um, in various places. Um, so uh, I think, again, Tuskegee is trying to give Hungerford a boost in this very difficult time. This is just Hungerford by the numbers in 1915. 25 students, 14 students, so small at this point. 25, only 25 students. Um, and then you sort of see the breakdown of sort of the things that they're supplying uh, uh, from their work there. This is, this is now where I'm starting to get into some of the more uh, interesting research. Uh, and what we had always known that farmers conferences were held at Hungerford. These are based on a model uh, that began in, at Tuskegee in 1892. And uh, Hungerford began to hold annual conferences beginning in uh, 1910. And um, what's interesting is this is, I think, demonstrates that the school had an impact well beyond the students who attended. Maybe there's 25 students, but their, their mission extends to the community at large, the entire surrounding community. And during the farmers' conferences, uh, the, all of the people from, from the area were invited to the campus to, to, to learn, to exchange stories, to, gain, to exchange information. Uh, and I thought this was such a great quote from the Springfield Republican. Um, this is the people's university. That's a takeaway, right? So this school had a role that the community did not, was not closed out uh, the, the doors were open, the campus was open, and the students became the hosts, and the teachers became the hosts. Parents and grown-up sons and daughters, too old to enter regularly into school, come from near and far and live at the school for two days, themselves and their mules. Teachers and students constitute the faculty, and everyone, from the principal to the youngest student, is expected to render some service to the visitors, if only to show a pleasant space and good manners. And I'm running, I don't, I'm going to want to run short here, but the farmers are exchanging stories, and it's a story of progress. They're, they're getting land, they're improving their homes, churches, and schools. Successes and failures alike are freely recited, and out of these varied experiences, all are instructed, warned, or inspired. In the eight years the conference has been in operation, many have bought homes, improved their schools and churches, and sent their children away to learn trades and get education beyond that of their home schools. So it's kind of an informal extension service being run out of Hungerford. And uh, interestingly, the school gets uh, a closer study in 1915. The U.S. Department of Education uh, is sponsoring this. Uh, the director of the Phelps Stokes Fund uh, visits schools all around the country. It's an, a, a really detailed report. And I just wanted to show you, uh, this is a snapshot in 1910. I wanted to highlight the di differential in pay for the teacher salaries. This is in the public schools. 40,000 for whites, 6,000 for African Americans. Teacher salaries per child, six to 14 in the county, $19.83 for white, $4.53 for African American. Percentage illiterate, 1910. Look at the difference statistically. Um, so there's a real need for schools. They're being, you know, they're not, the, the, the children of, who are being educated in this system, African American children are being systematically denied access to education. Um, and by the way, this also in that same report it tells you the sources of income for the school, almost entirely donations, tuition and fees, 289, Orange County, 175. So very little money coming in from the county, probably for the one teacher that they're employing for the public school students. Booker T. Washington, as I said, was not unaware of the disparities. Uh, I, this is a quote from a talk right be, at, near the end of his life. There's sometimes talk about the inferiority of the Negro. In practice, however, the idea appears to be that he is a sort of superman. He is expected with about one-fifth of what the whites receive for their education to make as much progress as they are making. Taking the southern states as a whole, about $10.23 per capita is spent in educating the average white boy or girl, and the sum of $2.82 per capita in educating the average black child. So you really see it spelled out in dollars and cents there. So Hungerford is forced to sort of fund itself. 
And that's going to lead to some real problems in the 1930s. Uh, the principal of the school is not raising enough money. Uh, this is the Great Depression. He, in effect, allows the school to, he's, he, he feels he's owed for his services. And um, in order to pay him, they decide they're going to mortgage the property. And so they amend the charter to allow up to, I think they raise the debt limit from 10 to 25K and they agree to pay him, but they default. And um, so he seeks foreclosure on the property. This is a critical moment, right, in the history of the school. It could have, could have gone away right then. Um, the trustees go to court to seek to cancel the mortgage as illegally executed. And the courts, basically agree. Um, and it goes back to something that happened in 19, 1910 when Calhoun died, they created a nonprofit corporation and the court says that never should have happened. Uh, this is a public charity, trust in a public charity and that legal structure was bad from the beginning and everything that was done under its authority is nullified. So they, they ruled that the, they had no basis for creating this original trust and um, so and one of the things that they point out is that um, it has been supported by private gifts, donations, and endowments. It, it's assumption of a recognized and important place in the function of educating Negroes entitled it to be considered a part of an educational system for the vocational education of Negroes as a public undertaking in this state. In effect, they're saying it's playing a public education role. It may be a private school, but we're treating it as a public charity and we have to protect it as such. It can't be dissolved by the actions of the original board. They dissolve the original board and they create what is a, a successor board, all white, appointed by the Chancery Court and the board of answers to the Chancery Judge. This is the board that's going to transfer the property to Orange County in the 1950s. The same, change, same judge, maybe a different makeup of the board, but uh, th this is an important shift in authority and control over the school there are biracial advisory boards and other ways in which the voices of African Americans are represented, but not in the running of the school. The, the board is now all white. And my student, again, Sarah, all credit to Sarah Boyd, who did this research, um, and she can tell you who each of these people are and what their, you know, where they live and what their occupations were. But just the big point here is she wanted to point out the racial breakdown. You see, it's almost even in 1899, uh, black is represented in teal, white is white. Uh, pink means unknown, and so that could shift. You could say if that shifted to, in 1912, it could be close to even in 1912. We don't know, but by 1952, all white. Um, so Hungerford weathers these troubles. This is a really difficult time for the school, thanks to a, a new principal, Captain Lorenzo Hall, gifts from private donors, and really importantly, support from Rollins College. Their, their, their archives are filled with uh, letters uh, from the 1930s. They created a Hungerford School Committee uh, made up of faculty and staff at Rollins. And um, they put out bulletins to explain why Hungerford was so important to raise money. Um, and so there's an institutional alliance there. Um, and that's gonna become important too when the, when the school is transferred because Rollins is going to stand by the school and argue that the Rollins, leaders of friends of Rollins, friends of Hungerford are, include uh, Rollins, very prominent Rollins professors. So something is happening in the 40s that is important to talk about here too. The enrollment shifts from a private boarding school to more of a public day school. And in, and in 1936, Winter Park starts to send all of its black high school students to Hungerford. That's the beginning of a transition to a almost uh, entirely public school system. It's already transitioning into a public school, um, but that changes the numbers too. And I, I actually used a, 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 a source of, a, of a, a book that kind of identified all the students and where they were from in 1941-42. And uh, most, almost 48 of the uh, 178 students came from Winter Park. And then you can sort of see a breakdown by other communities there. But, um, so Winter Park has a very strong connection to Hungerford as well. Uh, some pictures from the 1937-38 Bulletin. Um, so the school is changing, um, and importantly, um, there's now other forces that are 
going to be pushing the county to create a black public high school, to no longer just rely on Hungerford, but to acquire a facility. Uh, civil rights activism, which starts in the, the, you know, in the 20s and 30s, but after World War II, as you all know, the legal cases are starting to build up. The, the, the strategy at first was we will force Southern communities to equalize their schools. And they'll either equalize them or they'll have to desegregate. They may decide it's cheaper to desegregate, but that's a strategy. They don't immediately go after, you know, separate is inherently unequal. They say, you need to equalize. And so the Southern state and county governments are prepared to start building schools. And that's actually going to take some of the enrollment away from schools like Hungerford, right? They had been depending on students from Miami and other places coming and living there. Well, Miami neighborhoods are now getting public schools. Those students, their parents no longer need to send them to Hungerford. And that's changing the, the makeup of the school. Um, there's also a law, the minimum foundation program passed in 47, 48, to provide minimum educational opportunities for all children, regardless of their racial identity or where they live. And so that's, that's going to also force the, the, the equalization of, of facilities. Um, and so the Florida State Citizens Committee targets the Hungerford property as an ideal site for a, quote, a first class center of Negro education for the north and west areas of the county. They're eyeing that Hungerford property. Um, so, uh, in 1950, the court appointed trustees recommend turning Hungerford into a public Negro high school for Orange County. They had been working toward this, uh, and they said that either it has to become a fully private boarding school with a church or a private school affiliation or a fully public high school owned and operated by the Orange County uh, Board of Public in Instruction. If, to do nothing is to condemn the school to obsolescence. That's their argument. But they, and they, they, they enter, they enter into negotiations to sell, but the friends of the Hungerford School organize, and the friends include Dr. Hamilton Holt, former president of Rawlins, and Edwin Grover of Rawlins College, and the heirs of E.C. Hungerford, and they're trying to keep the school private. And um, they have what they believe to be a good, credible offer from Mary McLeod Bethune, uh, founder and president of Bethune Cooking College, uh, to purchase and operate this as a private prep school. But there's some question about whether the Bethune-Cookman is going to commit the funding or whether they want to rely on this just as a kind of informal relationship. The board determines that uh, the offer is not solid enough and they, they say, no, we're going to go ahead with the, uh, with the sale. And they vote to sell the property to Orange County for $16,571, <coughs> which is now worth, I think it's been assessed in the millions of I don't. I, I wish I included that because it has. There are there have been appraisals in recent years, um, and so this gets fought in court. The friends, through the air, uh, they sue. It goes to the Florida Supreme Court, and the court rules that the successor trustees, who appointed by the chancellor and under his supervision and control, had the authority to transfer the property. They answer to the Chancery Court, and they have the authority to do this. So this is another major transition. Hungerford begins its 17 year era as a public high school ser serving Eatonville and surrounding counties. That's a story best told by the alumni and they have done a wonderful job of preserving their memories. This is a quilt, an alumni, a memory quilt designed by Mary Daniels, class of 62. Um, and uh, we have been partnering with uh, Hungerford School alums to conduct history harvest. We had our first at the Hamble Square Heritage Center, it was our chance to sort of uh, practice uh, doing this for, for myself and some of our, our students who are, are doing this. But uh, we were able to interview uh, five people and um, scan some uh, artifacts, photographs, with the intention of creating a publicly accessible archive for the community, a community archive, to make sure that the, the memory, the physical artifacts, and that the oral tradition, we also recorded oral, oral histories and that those memories are not lost. And we are planning to have another one uh, in Eatonville uh, as part of the uh, Soaring and Hurston Festival for the Arts and the Humanities, January 25th and 26th. We're thinking it's going to be on the 25th if we have that. Okay, 53, the transfer of Hungerford School to Orange County is complete. There are plans for a new expanded Hungerford School for Negroes announced. This is 1953. What's happening in 1954? 
Brown v. Board of Education. This is on the eve. Everyone knows that the Supreme Court's taking up this great desegregation course. What is Orange County doing? They're building a school for Negro, a school for Negroes. They are not going to imagine this as a desegregated school environment. Um, and in fact, in 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court rules separate but equal unconstitutional orders public schools, including Hungerford, desegregated with all deliberate speed. Now, the local white segregationists said, hey, I think we're covered here, but we haven't been seeing much pressure to integrate the white schools. Um, they saw equalization and modernization as a bulwark against court-ordered integration, and they cited Hungerford as an example. This is from an article in the Sentinel. It'll be a long time before we'll have any change in Orange County, Orange County, regardless of how the Supreme Court rules, local officials told Sentinel Courthouse reporter Walter P. Jones. They believe this because they will tell you with pride that school facilities for Negroes in Orange County are just as good and modern as those for white children. And so they cite, the Sentinel reporter cites the recently modernized Hungerford School and a new elementary school for Negroes in Winter Park as prime examples of countywide school equalization efforts that officials hoped would forestall pressure from parents to integrate the white schools. And of course, the parents who sent their students to Hungerford had no interest in sending their students elsewhere. This was their school. They had deep attachment to it. And in fact, the fact that it became a public school made that attachment even stronger. Um, so just to say that the county, this idea that the county came in, bought this property cheap, right? Uh, they, got, they would have had to spend a whole lot more money if they hadn't sort of used their their leverage to get the property. Um, but they didn't, they were constantly selling off land without giving anything back to the, to the school. And in 1964-65, uh, when OCPS sold Hungerford Acreage to the state for an I-4 right-of-way, the PTA demanded that half of the proceeds from the sale be returned for improvements to the school, to school facilities. The money was not coming back. And the, the PTA and the alums demanded it. And this is from the memoirs of Frank Ogie, who was the principal in school, so he would know. Um, he says maybe they would have done those improvements, but maybe not. So he really credited the PTA with having forced the county to give something back. Um, in 1967 is another timeline moment. This is when, when desegregation has arrived. And uh, typically, as we know, desegregation, the burden of desegregating fell on black communities to desegregate the white schools. Um, they did not envision sending white students to Hungerford. They basically phased it out, and they replaced it with a renamed vocational school, Wymore Technical Comprehensive High School. Um, so this is the, really a, a fundamental change. Uh, and uh, Mr. Oti said that this was a moment when Hungerford's high school lost its position as a major institution in the town of Eatonville. Um, they decided that the school should no longer function as an academic vocational school, but rather as an alternative school providing vocational training and career education for non-college bound students. And so consequently, he writes, the institution that had been an integral part of the community since 1899 became the Wymore Career Education Center. Um, the people of Eatonville, the, pe the alumni, what they fought was not the change in the use of the school so much as the change in the name. Um, they, they actually brought suit to keep the name and they lost. But once again, the county ignored them. You know, they, this is another case where the community says, you know, one thing and the county, this county schools do another. Um, what was this cultural significance of Hungerford's closing? I think maybe there are other opinions on this, but I, I think that uh, Mr. Oti is, explains why uh, it was such a blow to, you know, the school and its place in the community. Most local citizens opted to send their children to traditional high schools outside the community. And although the hallways of the school continued to be filled with students, they were bussed in from other communities and returned to those neighborhoods at the end of the day. The local residents no longer felt any ties to the school. Um, I think, I, I, John Beecham had told me that I think there was still a tie to the, the school as a, as a cultural property and that events were held there and football games were held there. But I think he's making the case that uh, there's, there's definitely a change. Um, the local resident, okay, no longer do the majority of its teachers reside in Eatonville and hold leadership roles in its religious, economic, and political establishment. No longer can the majority of the town's young people identify themselves as alumni of the historic Hungerford High. Yet the school is a commanding physical presence in the town and continues to provide a quality educational experience for many youth in Orange County. 
In that regard, the tradition established by Hunger for its founders and perpetuated through the years by its faculty, staff, and students live on. But he really sees that as, as a key moment. And that's earlier than I had understood. So I, I appreciate, and this was really from my conversations with John Rary, John. Thank you, I, at our History Harvest, John very graciously uh, sat down for an interview and described that, that change uh, and dated it to, 18, to 1967. Um, in 1999, the county closed Wymore Technical School, but public pressure forced it to reopen. The historic name was restored. It was called Robert Hungerford Prep Preparatory High School, the first all-county magnet school. Uh, but 2009, the school closed for good. The Or Orange County initiated the process for sale. Uh, in 2020, in a very uh, sneaky way, the buildings were demolished without any notice. Nobody, I guess people, from what I heard in a public meeting, people were out with phones capturing it when they learned what was happening and uh, saw things being thrown in dumpsters. And uh, then Orange County launched a new effort, this is 2021, to sell the remaining 100 acres or 90 plus acres of the former site. And this was one of the developer plans. This didn't ultimately, wasn't the final one, but this is one that, uh, of, of the kinds of ideas that were being put forward for the use of this property. And you can kind of see how it was uh, laid out there. Commercial, retail, affordable rental unit, townhome, civic building. Um, that deal, the developer changed. Uh, in 2022, this is important, the deed restriction requiring use of Hungerford School for property for educational purposes was lifted, and that really cleared the way for the sale and development of the property. Uh, OCPS entered into a purchase and sale agreement with pers a prospective developer uh, pending Eatonville Town Council vote on proposed changes to zoning and comprehensive master plan. Now this is where Eatonville's history as a historic black township is important, because that town, that's, that's self, this is self-government, government, right? This is a moment when the people of Eatonville are going to decide the fate of this property. Their representatives are going to make, have votes, and uh, there's going to be considerable pressure applied uh, by uh, a couple of, uh, of the activists in the room, Julian Johnson and John Beecham, really rallied to raise awareness of what was happening, to uh, advertise the meetings, and uh, make sure that people knew what was at stake. Uh, John, uh, Beecham uh, really, I thought, got was key to capturing the media attention with the phrase land back. Uh, he can tell you about that. We should give him a chance to talk about that. But there's, I, there's the only picture I have of you, John, is with me from, from last week. But I know every picture John has, he has land back in front of him. But that was, a, that was a slogan that really caught fire. And the media saw these signs all along the Hungerford property. And suddenly, you've got this news coverage, right? Wesh 2. And I think that has, that media coverage is very important. And the media coverage just kept ratcheting up to the point eventually where CBS Sunday mornings did it, devoted a 10, like an eight, 10 minute feature, a long, well, maybe it's eight minute feature and a follow up story to what was happening in Eatonville. And that was initiated by Southern Poverty Law Center when they became involved they have a media team, and they were super effective at getting the story out. But I think it started, I want to say, it started with the local activists. It would not have happened without people willing to stand up and maybe make some enemies, too, right? To have to say, you know, to come out against uh, positions that were taken by people um, takes a lot. And so that's part of the story. And I'm not, I can't devote much time to it here because it's the end of my time. But you'll see that both uh, Julian Johnson and John Beecham were quoted in these stories, and, and they were rallying people and using everything at their disposal, disposal social media, um, walking tours, talks, uh, anything to get people to appreciate what, what was at stake here. Um, 2023, the Eatonville Town Council had second vote, second hearing, and final hearing on the proposed changes, and they reversed their vote. And they voted to reject these changes, and the developer elected to terminate the sales contract on the property. But the Orange County School Board basically just said, we'll pause, but they, they did not make any concessions on the future of that property. And so uh, the Association to Preserve the Eatonville Community, PEC, represented by the Southern Poverty Law Center, 
filed a lawsuit against Orange County Public Schools to ensure that the Hungerford property continues to be used for educational and related purposes that benefit the community. And that suit is pending, so stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good. We got some people in the room here who can speak more to what's happening lately with the lawsuit and, and what's happening on the ground. This has really been an archival, more of an archival story I'm telling here, but um, hopefully. Any questions? Do you want to, I know we have a lot of people here right now who are actively involved in efforts. Do you want a moment to speak to people and tell them about what you're doing and how they can support you? Yeah? Not to put you on the spot, but... Hello, everyone, and thanks for coming out. One of the things that Dr. Prince talked about when he was talking about the agriculture part of Edenville, but Booker, Booker T, uh, George Washington Carver also was at Tuskegee. And so that kind of makes sense on the agriculture piece. But I think the most important thing to me is that, is that it is history we're fighting for. It's not just land and apartment complexes. Like Dr. Prince said, it's about emancipation. It's about Abraham Lincoln. It's about Andrew Johnson rescinding the law. It's about their Freedmen Bureau, how they, was supposed to fund the 40 acres of a mule and, and, and take the abandoned land after the Civil War and distribute it out, and that land wasn't given. Often wonder why, why, what would have happened if that would, that would have happened. And then when we look at, 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 at even going around Lake Lily and, and the freed people gather around that lake and that land lake was given based on freedom, it, it's, that's one of the reasons that I think that I see Edenville as a living museum. It's not a just about, it's not a black or white thing. Edenville belongs to all of us. It is history to make it. We know that when people travel to Disney World, they come every five years to have to change the attraction or ride. But when you come to Edenville, it's history. They want to see it over and over again. I think the most important thing to me also too is, is that it wasn't that the black people did it on their, on their own. They did it with a citizen Maitland. We did it. We did it together. We're better together because those people, back in the day, Lawrence Lewis, they had Josiah Eden. They had courage. They did the right thing. And I think that when we want to make this place a better place for our kids and our grandkids, we all have to invest in that. We all have to call OCPS and tell them the story. This is about a story about freedom, the town that freedom built. Whether we want to believe it or not, slavery was real. Some of these acts was real. It wasn't like, uh, it's not make-believe. And I understand the cry, it wasn't me. It wasn't I. I didn't do it. I got it. But sometimes in life, I've learned as a man that I have to apologize for the sins of my father. I think we're better together. And I think if we look at our world now, and the reason we're repeating all of this racial stuff and all the things that are going on, it's because we have forgotten the story. We've forgotten the story. Abraham Lincoln was assassinated because of that cause. The Kennedy boys was assassinated because of that cause. And we're here today at historic Maitland in Edenville, still fighting for those rights. And I, I think, again, back to our story that we tell, we're better together. So I thank everyone for coming out tonight. I thank Dr. Scott French for telling his story, but the story goes on. So we, what we want to do is, what's your story? And that's the story. Who are you going to tell tomorrow about this story? And what, and will you create another storyteller? That's the story. It's a, it's, a, it's a love story. It's a story about America. And Edenville is a living museum. It's in the Smithsonian and it's here in this little town called Maitland and Edenville. And we did it together. So thank you very much, Dr. Scott Prince, for putting a highlight on what's yeah. important. I'm Julian Johnson. Um, yeah, thank you, Dr. French. Honestly, uh, it was a um, 
every time I, I see you, I learn more, right? I wasn't prepared to give a speech, honestly. I didn't plan any of this, but uh, thank you all for coming out. And just like John Beecham said, uh, continue to tell the story. Like.